During the European Middle Ages, Roman numerals were used for recording numerical values. Roman numeration is additive, so the value is the sum of the symbols written. There were actually two forms, the original Latin form and what's usually referred to as the Germanic form, which we still see in page numberings. So as in Egyptian hieroglyphic, we have symbols for one, ten, hundred, and thousand, but we also have symbols for five, fifty, five hundred. Typically the Latin forms were used for carvings and inscriptions, while the Germanic forms were used for handwritten manuscripts. And what this also means is that the Germanic forms tended to vary a little bit in their details. And one important note here is that the the one has two different forms where we use the J for the last I of a number. For readability, we'll use the Latin forms. So we might want to interpret this value. And we see there is an M, that's 1,000. There's two C's, that's 200. The L is a 50. The X is a 10. The V is a 5. And the two I's is a 2. And so this number is 1,200. 50 and 10, that's 60. 5 and 2, 7. We could also write numbers. Let's write 268 and 49. So 200 is two hundreds. That's two C's. 60 is 50 and 10. L, X. 8 is 5 and 3 ones. And so 268 would be 40, well that's four tens. Nine is five and four ones, and so 49 would be 49. For large numbers, a variety of symbols were used. The most common was to put what we might call ears on a smaller symbol. This actually seems to be the origin of the symbols for the larger numbers. So this is one. If I put ears around it, it's a thousand. And if that's a thousand, then it's almost intuitive that this is 500. And these last two forms evolve into M and D, while this form for a thousand also is written this way. Even larger numbers could be produced by adding more ears with each additional pair, increasing the value by a factor of 10. So we have 1,000. If I add another pair of ears, that's 10,000. If I add another pair, that's a hundred thousand, and so on. So we might write the number, and so this is two ten thousands, one hundred, seventy, well that's a fifty and twenty, and then three. And likewise we could read a number. So this is 10,000, this is 1,000, so altogether 11,000. These are 300s, a 50 and a 30, or 80, and 2. So that's 11,382. A second method to express large numbers was to put a bar over a number. So V is 5, but if I put a bar over it, that now represents 5,000. And the bar could be extended over several symbols. So here we have the number 121, but if I put a bar over it, it's 121,000. And so this allows us to write larger numbers as well. So for example, 436,285 so there are 436 thousands, so which we'll write as 436 with a bar over it. There's also 285, which we'll write as 200, 
80, that's 50 and 30, and 5. And so I can write the number as... Or we could read numbers. So this first part is that many thousands. Well, that's 200, 10, 5, and 1. That's 16. So this is 216,000. Meanwhile, the last part is 285. Now, note that writing a number like 49 required writing down a lot of symbols. To save space, we can use what's known as subtractive notation. A 1, 10, or 100 placed before the next higher value means to subtract it. So LX is 50 and 10, that's 60, but XL is 10 subtracted from 50, or 40. Very rarely, like once in history, scribes would use notations like IC, 1 subtracted from 100, but this was not standard. The Romans used subtractive notation if they felt like it. And during the medieval period, subtractive notation became more common, again, if they felt like it. So we could write the number like 98 or 464. So 90 is 10 from 100, xc. 8 is 5 and 3, so 98 would be... And it's worth pointing out that subtractive notation was always optional, so it's just as correct to write it this way. Meanwhile, 400 is 100 from 500, C, D, 60 is 50 and 10, 4 is 1 from 5, so 464 is, and again, it's just as correct to not use subtractive notation. Now, legal documents and binding contracts were required to use Roman numerals and not to do Hindu-Arabic numerals. In fact, in 1299, the city of Florence in Italy actually banned the use of Hindu-Arabic numerals and, about 50 years later, the University of Pavia, also in Italy, required book prices to be labeled using clear letters, which is to say Roman numerals, and not ciphers, the Hindu-Arabic numerals. This wasn't a matter of just being conservative or unwilling to change. There was a real problem here, and that problem is fraud. It's easy to alter a number written in Arabic numerals. A 13 could, with a few strokes of a pen, easily become a 48. Meanwhile, altering a number written in Roman numerals was much harder. And if you note, the Germanic form had a different I for the terminal I of a number, and this is one of the reasons why the Germanic terminal I was written the way it was, because it indicates that that is the end of the number and you can't add anything past it. The practice actually survives today when we write checks, if we still write checks, and have to spell out the numerical amount.